morning to you, Mr. Flores. I'm Nancy De Los Santos. Good morning. And today is the 7th day of January 2011. Who would think that we'd still be here in <laughs> 2011? We are in Los Angeles, California, and we are interviewing Mr. Ralph Flores for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Flores, for joining and agreeing, joining us today and agreeing for the inter to be interviewed for our project. If, as you know, if there's anything you don't want to discuss, you don't have to. If there's something you want to say, please just let me know. At any point you want to stop to get a drink of water or use the facilities, please let me know again. And as we said earlier, your interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin. So let's begin. Tell me about your childhood, where you were born, and what you remember growing up as a young boy. Where you were born, what city, and what you did as a young boy. Well, <clears throat> I was born in El Paso, Texas. Mm -hmm. And what I can remember is that I was raised by my grandmother while my mother was working mm -hmm. because uh, my father abandoned us mm -hmm. right after I was born. And what I remember is that I was always hustling. I started, first business I had was a shoe shine boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my favorite spot was the Elks, which I'm still a member. Why and was the Elks a favorite spot? The Elks, because they, they, that's where I had my customers to change oh, shoes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I had also a, a paper route trying to have with money. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there on, we just struggling to go through grammar school, finish grammar school, I started going to high school, and went for a semester. When semester ended, there was no work around there. And the trend was uh, the childhood, we hopped the freight train, come to California, so I migrated to California after 15 days on the, on the road, I mean five days on the road, and I landed up in Los Angeles. The first stop was Olvera Street. From there, <clears throat> we had 25 cents between uh, my buddy and I. We had a, a little pie to eat. We would come across a friend from El Paso. He put us for one night only. And next day on Monday, I started working in the laundry. And my friend went to Chinese shoes somewhere in uh, Broadway and Fifth Street in some barber shop, but no place to stay. So what we did, we went up to the Central Market, got a whole bunch of cardboard papers, went up to a hill, Sunset and Hill, right behind a big billboard at that time, and put up a tent, and there we slept for two weeks. I consider myself one of the first homeless. Okay, so <clears throat> the first week they, we didn't get, I didn't get paid. The second week I got paid. Then we went up and rented a apartment on a grand, <clears throat> that's where a lot of people from El Paso were living. They all uh, on the same year, age bracket. And uh, so I worked there for, for a while. Then, then I went back to work too. Brown Davis, who was washing pots and pans. And after a couple of weeks, I progressed to inside the kitchen, to washing dishes. Then I got sick, and, uh, <clears throat> and I landed up on, uh, with a, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Appendicitis had blown up. And uh, Took a while for the recovery. My stepfather had to come over to find out what's happening by that time. That's what I can remember until I went and landed up in uh, Bakersfield 
start working on the fields. Okay, but let, let's stop there because I want to do a little bit more of your childhood. What year did you get on that freight train? You said you were 15 years old? Yes, so, so it was 1935. 1935, right. So this was during the Depression. It was during the Depression. Or, or yeah, towards the end at, of the At that time, there was no work back in El Paso. Mm -hmm. uh, all the students and all everybody was not working, of course. Just struggling, and this is where the train was to get the freight train to California because mm -hmm. there was always work here. Okay, but back in El Paso, when uh, it sounds that, do you have other memories of your childhood? Any games that you played during school? Were you? Oh, yeah. Well, yes, we we used to be, uh, play the basketball on the courts up on the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to go over there, have little battles with uh, other areas and, and the barrios. Mm -hmm. Nothing serious, just a little bit hassles and maybe a little fist fight, but mm -hmm. uh, not, nothing serious. What is the, your memories of your, you said you're raised by your grandmother. So what are the memories of your grandmother and raising Well, <laughs> one of the things that she was very strict and uh, I remember Coscorrones, and she put on the listen, or others was when it says, Rafaelito, and I couldn't listen. Then before I knew it, she had to look, Pellizcos, Rafaelititito, and she said, yes, mama. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then when we were playing up there on the street, she used to come on, to, for me to come back home to eat, and uh, Rafaelito, because she used to holler at me, clap her hands, Rafaelito, Rafaelito. And I, I didn't want to listen to the other kids, come on, Rafaelito, you know, make fun of me. <laughs> so consequently, after a while, we started going up, they started calling me Rafaelito. Then I got to the, the nickname Fito. Fito. And uh, up to now, some of my friends are still having in Pico Rivera, uh, from El Paso, they still call me Fito. Uh -huh. uh, did your grandma, now how, what are your memories of your mother? She was working during this time? <clears throat> My mother, I always uh, remember her as a uh, very light complexion mm -hmm. and uh, other cousins were light complexions because came from the same area. What area was that? Uh, Chihuahua, and, uh, Durango, the area. Uh, so, I remember that uh, as I was growing up, they used to say, Mira que simpatico él y tan negrito. And I said, What do you call me negrito for? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> of course, they tried to compare me with uh, her. You can imagine me in the dark days or summer days. I work on the sun, uh, my complexion was a little darker than the usual. So I was conscious about the, the race, even in my own, my own home, or the color of the skin. Mm -hmm. And my cousins, they were all uh, mixed. I had about three cousins. They were one my color, another one really light complexions. And, uh, but we never talk about our, our difference in color, just the, the, the ladies. And uh, <clears throat> I used to hear the, 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 her, my mother's cousin say, mira, the negrito, él, you know, this type of thing. So I used to hear my mother, how come you call me negrito? I said, ay, negrito, no le hace pero tan chulo. So my good, my ego went up high because I was a chulo. Up to now, you, I even go to my hairdresser and say, mija, ponme chulo, so que voy a bailar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this type of memories that I... I and that was your mother who called you? From my mother, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. But she always called me Ray. We slept together until I was about 13 years old, I can mm. believe. Just before she got married, because mm -hmm. we lived in one uh, apartment. You and lived in an apartment or a house with your grandmother? No, no, an apartment in, uh, uh -huh. with my grandmother. Okay. A, a, a two-room apartment. Mm. So they can afford over there, because mm -hmm. you used to earn about four dollars a week, and uh, it's what you pay a month for dollars. 
And what type of work did your mom do? Laundry. Laundry. She worked in the laundry. Mm -hmm. That's why they used to call her La Gringa Arruinada because no Anglo lady would work on the, mm -hmm. who would call the sweat mines there. It's now we, we call them the sweat mines. That time we just, mm -hmm. the, the migrants from uh, Mexico would come and work. Mm -hmm. And so. And they called it the Gringa Arruinada. Arruinada, ruin, ruin American. In other words, uh, yeah. No poor American will work on the, on the laundry. And they call her that because she looked... Because she looks a, a, a mm -hmm. gringa. Mm -hmm. She was a, a white hair and a Blonde, was she blonde? Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. blue eyes. And it, it looks like a... When we moved to Bakersfield, they, they thought she was an Oki. Mm, wow, <coughs> she was really white. Yeah, really blue, white. And blue eyes. Blue eyes. Oh. My sister, Delia, had the same complexion, blue eyes mm -hmm. as she does, mm -hmm. so does her daughter. Mm -hmm. So the rest of us were just, uh, you know, mid, mid colors. Now but you knew that there was not any work during that time. Do, did you know that it was the Great Depression? Did your family talk about that? Did they say it's the Depression, as we talk about now, the recession? No, we, 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 we just, uh, the, we, we're living through it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the reason, because she, my mother was working all the time, so we had food on the table all the time. We didn't go to, I remember going through uh, any other hair uh, coming in. Right. So there was always food on the table, mm -hmm. and because uh, she was working. I see. Did your family participate in any of the programs that the government had, President Roosevelt at the time, like CCC or the WPA? Well, Yes, my cousin did. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he was nine years older than I, mm -hmm. going through high school. He went, he got married and went to the uh, PWA. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a couple of times uh, he couldn't go to work, so he sent me to take his place. <laughs> How old are you, though? And that time I must have been about 13, but I was tall. And, and um, so I did. He gave me half of the salary, 75 cents a day. And what kind of work did you do? It, it was just labor, yeah. holding uh, stuff there, shoveling, mm -hmm. just make, make work over there. <laughs> That's what I remember uh, Pete, uh, WP, but he also very active in uh, football. It was a football team. He was uh, the big shot, mm -hmm. <clears throat> a star player, and he also formed a private team. Mm -hmm. And the football, because they used to have a, a leagues there playing football. Mm -hmm. And I used to carry the bags and stuff. I was a caddy for for them. And the when I was a yeah, I must have been about ten years old, mm -hmm. something like that. You were the caddy at the where? Caddy for the football team. Football? I had to carry all the stuff. Oh, okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. And you were all didn't you also work at the um, El Paso Country Club? Then afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. I went to work when after my father, my mother married my stepfather. We moved to a country club. You moved to a country club? <coughs> there to the, to live in El Paso. And you moved to the country club? Well, into the area. Oh, into the area, okay. The area. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that's where I went to work for the caddy, mm -hmm. you know, for a couple of months before I, I left here mm -hmm. to Los Angeles. Your stepfather, who was he? We didn't get a chance to talk about. He was uh, born and raised in El, El Paso, Jose Mena. Mm -hmm. And a uh, very nice guy. And he had uh, two daughters, a previous marriage, and a son. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so he and, your, he and your mother, did they have any children? Yes. They th had children? That's where I have my half-sister, uh, Oscar. Okay. Elva and Elia. Yeah. Did his children also live with you? No. Okay. They were married and lived in Los Angeles. So he was an older gentleman then? Yes, he was uh, 10 years older than my mother. Okay. Did you uh, speak Spanish at home? Mostly, yes. Mostly? Did and in school. And in school. And in school you spoke Spanish? Yeah, we spoke Spanish. Uh, they tried not, uh, not to uh, just try not for us not to speak Spanish, but we did, you, you naturally have it. Okay. Unless all the time we spoke English, 
was when the director of hair. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we had some details to do. But when the private conversation, let me this, it's Spanish, it just came naturally. Mm -hmm. And when they heard you speaking Spanish, was there any retribution on that? Well, they, uh, they, they tried, but they, they couldn't, because uh, you, you have to really catch you doing it. Mm -hmm. We tried not to be caught in Spanish in front of the teachers, of course, okay. just on the, on the side. Yeah. And tell me about school. So we'll talk about grammar school for a little while, because <coughs> you were only in high school for a little while. A little right? while. Okay, so tell me about grammar school. Did the <coughs> teachers treat you nicely? Were there any clubs you were, was it mostly no, a Latinos? I, I, I don't remember, I don't, no pressure, we were treated equally, we learned, and um, I, I, I used to excel in uh, on math, I always got a hundred in it, and uh, I had a good relationship with my schoolmates, uh, some of the ladies' uh, friends, you know, that met over there. Uh, very nice uh, relationship that I can remember. Gringos were in your school? Were so grammar school. Latinos and gringos in the same school? We were, were mostly Latinos, okay. was predominantly. Hmm. Was it segregated or that's just the way it was? That's the way it was because hmm. uh, uh, the whole area was nothing but Latinos. Okay. You had to go live up north of the, of the cities where the Anglos were in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the whole town was separated. And what about high school? Why didn't you stay? What was high school like that you didn't like about it? Well, high school was because of uh, economics. By that mm -hmm. time, uh, I was 15 and trying to dress a little better. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something about a high school. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that uh, we had to have a study, right study hall, go to the, to the main uh, uh, hall, and we had aisles to sit down in the area, in the side of the, of the hall, of the area, of the entrance. And every time I turned around, I seen a nice lady there, and I just smiled at her. So after a couple of times, uh, about oh, two or three days later, as I, the study hall ended, we all got up to, went towards the aisle to go out. But she stopped me. And me dice, oh, you going to say, <coughs> How come every time you turn around, you smile at me? <clears throat> so I didn't know what to say. I was shocked, you know. I was a shy guy. But then she looked down and started smiling. And I looked down to what she was smiling at. And the first time I noticed my tennis shoes, the little toes were sticking out like they were socks. Mm -hmm. And she just smiled and took off. And the first time I noticed my, my tennis had holes in it. You know, I put them on and it, just, it was natural. Uh -huh. And this is what I said, I need to get a pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and believe it or not, that's when I, <coughs> I started working in a security there. I got some money. Then I had to go to Juarez and buy my first pair of shoes. Okay? What do you uh, mean your first pair? Like your first pair of leather shoes? Leather right? shoes, okay, yeah. you know, the kind of yellow, sparkly yellow, okay? Sparkly yellow? Yeah, yellow shoes. I don't know why, but that's <laughs> what I picked. <coughs> <laughs> but that's how poor we were. And uh, that's when they decided, uh, hey, you got to go work and do something. Mm -hmm. so now, this girl who laughed at you, was she Latina? Or was yes, she, she, she was Latina, Latina. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What kind of things did you do in school the little bit of time were, that you were there? Did you, were you there one year or one semester? The, the one semester. One semester. You weren't really there long enough the, to the, <laughs> do no, anything. Not really. How about after school? What did you do when maybe uh, after, what did you do for fun when you were a teenager? What is for fun is just, uh, <clears throat> you, you go to the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And uh, just play basketball. That's about what, what mm -hmm. that I like basketball. And uh, go home. Dances, picnics. No, not dancing. That time was. Uh, you know, no, no, no when dancing not yet. Not, not until I became a teenager. There was uh, in Bakersfield when I started dancing. Okay. Cotton fields. 
Okay, well, that's where we left you. Let's see. So we got you. You you left. You got on the freight train, 1935. You went with your buddy. You were five days on the road. On, Correct. On the freight train. And then you wind up in Olvetta Street. You have 25 cents. You stay with a friend for one day. Did he tell you one day and one day only? Yes, right. One night only. <laughs> but he, he was a married guy. Okay. He was, must have been about 18 or something like that. All righty. And then, what did you do? Well, we slept uh, the night. Next day, I, they told me where to go find a job, and I went and applied mm -hmm. the laundry there by the Chinatown oh. on Grand Street. <clears throat> of course, I was only 15, but I could pass by 18 because I was a tall guy. Mm -hmm. And that got hard, and that's when I started working in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. No and food, no, no place to stay. That's when you were homeless. That's when yeah. I became the homeless there in the Sunset and Hill. Sunset and Hill? Right now it's a big building now. Oh, Before yeah. Yeah. it was a vacant lot there, that corner. Uh -huh. Were there other people there? No, it was the only ones there. Yeah. We just found a spot there, yeah. clean up with the bushes. Did you find the Chavez Ravine area that was nearby? Did you know the Chavez Ravine area that was there? Because there was a lot of Mexicanos there. No? Well, we there where we, we, I didn't know any yeah. there. Um, so you were there, and then when did you get sick with hepatitis? <coughs> no, not hepatitis, um, but... Um, a, a appendix. Appendicitis. Yeah, appendicitis, sorry. Appendicitis. Uh, that must have been in uh, around October. 1935, mm -hmm. and that's when I ended up in the emergency in the hospital. County? Sit Lake County. Right across the street here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it uh, took a little while before they get a okay from my mother, because I, I was underage. Mm -hmm. But I got up right on and survived. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the good Lord. Absolutely. And then what did you do after that? Your your father, your my, stepfather my, went my, back my home? My stepfather uh, uh, broke. I came over and brought him over to his daughter, one of his daughters uh -huh. in L.A. And I stayed there for about, about a month to oh, recover. that was nice. Yeah. He decided not to go back to El Paso, so he went to Bakersfield to start working over there. Mm -hmm. So I went and joined him, and in a couple of months we put our money together sent for my mother and, and my brother and sister. And what work were you doing in Bakersfield? Keep picking the fields, working mm -hmm. on the fields. Field work. Field work. Picking potatoes, onions, mm -hmm. whatever was left there to be picked. So when did your mom come? About what year then? 19 in uh, 1930, January 1936. 1936, mom, okay, comes. Then, so, in the 1940s, right before the war, were you in Bakersfield? You stayed in Bakersfield? In 1940, yes, uh, <coughs> stayed in Bakersfield area. You were there for f a few years. And were you dating at that time? You were now 15, 20. so you were about 18, 19 years old? Yeah, I was dating several ladies there from... Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> the Leno, the Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. That's when I was we danced, danced in the uh, Jitterbug. Mm -hmm. Were you good at that? Yes. As a matter of fact, we used to come over to uh, LA to, for the big band to the Palladium. Oh, uh -huh. that's a long ride. It was a long ride, but it was uh, five of us used to come over and just. To listen to the music and uh -huh. dance, yeah. then and drive back. What was and you drive back the same day? Same day. Wow, so that's a long ride. What kind of car did you have? Uh, that at that time uh, it was not my car. When I, I had a nineteen thirty-two Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a big car. Well, the, that time it was yeah. a nice mm -hmm. car. Yeah. The first one was for 1927 Chevrolet that I drove from uh, Bakersfield to Fresno 
It took me uh, over 28 hours to get over there, which now it takes about six. Yeah. <laughs> up, 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 but we got over there. <laughs> was the grapevine even there? Or there's no grapevine, was there? The was highway? No, no, it was from Bakersfield on. See, it's, oh. Uh, uh, where there was a hill was up there by Los Baños. Uh -huh. That's when it, it just barely yeah. made it over okay. there. But to come to Los Angeles from Bakersfield, didn't you have to go over oh, there? Oh yeah, we, we, yeah, but uh, uh, not on a 27 Chevrolet, no. No. no there, uh, later on, we used to come over with, with a different car. Okay, yeah, I just now. Well, the, 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 that was my first car, and then I went to a 32 Chevy. Okay. What road did you take when you were going from Bakersfield to Los Angeles? Take up 99, mm -hmm. all the way up to Gilroy and then to, to San Jose. And then to Los Angeles? Uh, and, uh, well, the, the, no, no, there was afterwards. See, mm -hmm. that, we're talking about the area from 1940. Oh. I was in Bakersfield right. and used to go up there. Okay. And just for recreation overnight, we used to go from Bakersfield to LA. And how did you get from Bakersfield to LA? Well, there was somebody's car, I forget, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. one of the guys had a better car. Right. But I forget what it was, it must have been a Ford. And what road did you take? That, then 99, which mm -hmm. is five now. Yeah, which goes over the big yeah, mountain. Over the grapevine. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> just that. It's easy. It's just, is it like doing it right now? I guess. Okay. Um, so what, now we're up to the 1940s. And uh, when did you get married? Who was a kid? When did you get married to your first wife? First time was 1946. Okay. So it was after the war? After. Okay, let's, then let's wait until that. Do you re remember, do you recall when World War II started? And where were you, and what was going on at that time? When Pearl Harbor happened, do you recall that time? And tell me about that. Well, <coughs> I just recall when the, the war started, and we were up there in the cotton fields, and the, uh, harvest fields, put it this way. And uh, <coughs> we know that pretty soon, when the day we're going to be uh, rafted, so we just waited for us to do. In the meantime, uh, uh, job opportunities open. So we heard that there was opening for the in uh, what do you call it, uh, shipping industry uh -huh. in Oakland in the area. Mm -hmm. So they uh, found that there was a class in Fresno. For to, to be trained for an arc welder. So I went there for a, oh, about three or four months, took that class. And in the meantime, I was working uh, where I could work. Mostly was at the wrecking yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked there until I finished the class. Okay, this was in Oakland, California? No, there was in Fresno. In we're, Fresno? We're, we're working in a, uh, we're going to school and working there. Okay, so okay, in we're Fresno? Going to, we're going to Weldon School. And who was in that class? Who else was, were there other Latinos in that class? Were there African Americans? Were there white guys? There were both, all, all, all three of us, because there was mixed people, you know, kids uh, trying to learn the, the trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly the majority were uh, uh, Latinos. Did you have to pay for that class? No. Okay, but you had to? I had to qualify because uh, uh, I had a, a friend of the family that she was a social worker and she kind of was a very good friend of my mother. So she feel sorry for me and helped me out. Mm-hmm. And what did she do to help you out? I op opened the doors, how to qualify. Oh, mm-hmm. Because I tell you, what do you know? You know, just... Mm -hmm. And what did you have to do to qualify for the class? Just that I was uh, unemployed and, uh, and I had nobody to help me out because my mother was raising kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the, the conditions of uh, economically. Mm -hmm. 
And because uh, you were 18 years old at this point. About. Yeah, 18, 19. Somewhere around there. Uh, yeah. 20. Well, you're almost 20. If we're talking about 1940s. Right. So anyway, I don't remember how I qualified what I did. Okay. <coughs> then I went to work for the shipyards until I got drafted. Do you re do about you about a year and a mm -hmm. little over a year? Mm -hmm. Do you remember when Pearl Har Harbor happened? How it, you felt, or was there? When the what happened? Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I remember when the, the uh, how devastated it, it looked, it sounded, and of course uh, it's only it's hear about the news because mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, I don't remember in television or anything like that, it's just the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, you read the papers. Yeah. And uh, I felt that sooner or later we had to go and defend our country, right. personally. And so my friend and I decided, should we volunteer? Well, let's, we better we should, okay? Well, what are we kicking around? I got drafted. When that happened, then he went and enlisted in the uh, uh, Air Force. Mm -hmm. It's what he wanted. And I got right into the Army. Do you think during that time that your life as a Latino was about the same as other Latinos during that time? Were you any better off or less, less better off than most Latinos? Well, I, I, I did feel was better off. I was equal to uh, our environment. And uh, <coughs> as farm workers, uh, we all were in the same boat, just making it day by day. Because mm -hmm. sometimes uh, there was two or three months or uh, no work at all, so you had to rely on your savings. And uh, if you have any, That's about the only way I can remember that, uh, of course, I was always helping my stepfather and mother survive because I, That's hard. they were raising two, uh, three, three kids mm -hmm. at that time. As a matter of fact, I remember my mother saying, that they say, if it wasn't because of me, he wouldn't have uh, calzones to put on. Your stepfather? My mother. Oh. Because uh, my stepfather could just barely make enough to uh, to pay for the house or whatever it is no. to eat, but not enough to for her to buy her necessities. Wow! And what I used to do, I used to turn that money to her. She gave me something for spending. Mm -hmm. You know, so to me, this uh, <clears throat> for years I used to do that, helping raise the three kids. Yeah. And that was pretty much what you saw for the Latino community. Yeah. Everybody was about er, er, the same. Everybody in the same yeah. boat, just struggling. <coughs> but you said you were a part of this organization, the Knights of Columbus. Where did that happen? That happened after I got married in, in Wasco. Okay, so after the war. Right? Yes. Okay, so before you, before you were drafted, was your family a part of the war effort? Did they ration? Did they save? Did they, you know, the rubber, the tin foils, the stuff that, did they consider themselves to be political? Did they no. talk about the war? They just, they were. I don't were remember anything about it. Yeah. It was more to talk about it uh, with the kids, you know, talking around, when they, uh, sitting around with a beer or stuff like that. And, yeah. What are you saying? We all were anxious to go to war. Yeah. But your family, I mean, it sounds like they were just surviving. Yes, just, surviving. Yeah, it wasn't about the war for mm -hmm. them in, in many ways. So did they have gas ration coupons? Yes, they it, did. It did something mm -hmm. like that. Cause but they didn't it, participate in, you know, saving rubber bands or things like that? They had some assistance from the county. They, 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 that's where... Uh, the social worker sympathized with my mother and, and tried to help me. Okay. Because he, he couldn't he couldn't work for a while. Your stepfather? My stepfather. Why? What was wrong? 
Because she was sick, it was always sick, oh. uh, asthma, and, oh. and uh, just couldn't work. Just, yeah. Used to be a little handy, handyman work mm. once in a while. So that, that much. Mm. So in other words, nothing steady coming in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And working in the fields does not help asthma, for sure. You know, that's right. And uh, even if he did work, it was, it, it has to be peace work. So you slow, you make money. No money at all. Okay, let's talk about your enlistment and uh, or when you were drafted. How old were you? Where were you? Tell me. I know you said that it was the army. Okay, <coughs> I was drafted uh, in '42. Mm -hmm. I, I think it must have been in. So you're 22 years old. Somewhere in that, I forget the. Mm -hmm. Little part of. 42, and um, how did the how did you find out? You got a letter in the mail. Yes. Okay. And and uh, I went to the local board there in the Bakersfield, and from there I gave me a notice. So I qu gave my notice at work what I was working. And uh, got drafted. Then up in. Uh, how did how did your mother respond to you being drafted? Oh, she cried. She says, "Well, my was uh, God bless you and this and that." And but you have to do it. You have to do it. Just be a good boy. He says, "Take care of business." Okay. Okay. And then tell me where you went. You went to Camp So I went to <coughs> Camp Bill and uh, started as a tank uh, assistant driver in the tank course, middle, mm -hmm. middle corps. That's when I realized how limited my English speaking was. Mm. I could read and write it, <coughs> but when it comes to uh, speak in English, I had to think in Spanish and translate in English. <laughs> so that kind of make it stutter and that the co-workers, uh, the co-soldiers started making fun of me. You know, like a, a, started treating me like a second class Mexican, you know, this type of thing. So I took it, <clears throat> but I started struggling because I, I felt I was doing my duty and I realized my, li my limitations. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one day, a thing happens. Uh, we were l l later at night, we were to go to bed. So my body was next door, so I stood back, and I was to his left. They were playing uh, poker between them. So next to him, I was sitting down writing uh, some romantic letter, I guess, to one of my girlfriends. So I kept saying, Cooper, how do you spell this? Cooper, how do you spell that? So he, after a while, she grabbed my writing pad and said, ah, oh, damn, sir, you can write English. And then I very indignant says, you got damn right, so I went to school, didn't I? Holler, you know, <laughs> because I, I got disturbed because I put my path away. Now I very started laughing, you know, because it was just uh, yeah. about uh, 25, 30, I guess, uh, there in our, uh, mm. our camp, our tent. Anyway, things changes from there, because then I had two guys come over. They were from Arkansas or uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania somewhere, asked me to read their letters and to write the letters back. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, so you couldn't speak English too well, but you could read and write it, and these white guys from Arkansas were asking you to write their yeah. letters. <laughs> <coughs> so the, 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 to me, it was just a practice of uh, practicing English, yeah. because all through the uh, <coughs> three, four years there in, in the harvest fields, I spoke nothing but Spanish. 
whatever we went to the dance and once in a while just English but they're very limited even though the guys were born here they spoke perfect English but still in between us spoke Spanish mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway the, uh, my English started improving of course I have the accent I still have it because uh, one of my sergeants says, you know, I, I like your quaint accent. I didn't know I had an accent. <laughs> quaint? <laughs> yeah, quaint accent. <laughs> but it was quaint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So those are the, the memories that I have that were good and, and bad. Do you remember so, what it sounded like, your accent? What did it sound like? No, because you don't have an accent now. No, but just, uh, no, so I don't know. But uh, <laughs> <coughs> anyway, and I think that I start getting respect uh, from the guys was boxing. Mm -hmm. They all wanted to uh, to box a Mexican. I said, okay, come on, you guys. <laughs> and uh, she. Why had, did they want to box the Mexican? Because they, they, I was a stranger. I was a different. Or whatever. And these are things I experienced. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but then I become friends, you know, so some of the guys are good boxers. <clears throat> they taught me something, and, but they, they admired that I, uh, I was there. <clears throat> because I was in the sissy camp, you know. Uh, <clears throat> when were well, you in sissy camp? Sissy camp, well, that was about 1938. <clears throat> Okay, you didn't tell me about that. That was before the. It was before, uh, in between the uh, uh, harvest fields work. And and going in to the shipyards. See, so I joined there, and ended up in uh, Camp Beale there by uh, Northern California. Uh, Next to your basic training camp was the CC camp, Camp Bill, you called it. The, 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 no, there was Camp Bill is the army. Okay. And the CC camp was um, uh, up there by above Bakersfield, between Bakersfield and mm -hmm. Camp Isabella. And what did you do there at CC camp? Oh, just uh, <coughs> work on the, the roads, mm -hmm. labor, har jackhammer and s shoveling and stuff. Did you live there? You lived at the camp, at right? At the camp there. Yeah. And were there other Latinos there? How was that experience? There was... Uh, a few Latinos, yeah, mostly from L.A. Right. That's where I got introduced to marijuana. <coughs> At the CC camp? Yeah, CC camp. I said, try it, try it. I tried it once, didn't like it, so now forget it, not me. And, uh, <coughs> but there was a guy that was just a habit. And then start talk about it. There was just two or three other guys. And... There was a guy there that uh, told me how to box, we, we, you know. This uh, come I be able to defend myself at that time. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's what it came in handy in the army. <laughs> <laughs> so. Did you have any friends that you stayed in contact with during your basic training? Friends? Coop, yes, yes, Cooper. Cooper. Mm -hmm. Then we kept in touch up till uh, we separated. And, and then, of course, other friends that I have, uh, one of them was um, uh, Indian, native Indian, Cody, as, as I remember. We were close together because we were more or less uh, we were isolated by the other people, you know, because they're the cliques. Before my little clique came in, I. And that's about it. And were there, did you speak, uh, you talked a lot about Spanish, so to with the Latinos in your basic training, did you speak Spanish with them? When we, we, when we get together at the, at the, the bar, or, yeah, we spoke Spanish, but most of the time we tried to speak English because there was other guys there, you know, uh, all the time. Okay. And uh, the, most of them were uh, Californian, so they spoke good English. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> unless you come somewhere from uh, New Mexico, Texas, then of course they, they were used to 
Spanish, okay, mm -hmm. mixture. But uh, the, the, the most of the people were uh, Californian army, mm -hmm. so they spoke good English. Did you feel? Do you feel that the training that you received during basic training prepared you for war? For war? Yeah. Oh yes, very, very much so. Very hard, and uh, <coughs> we work hard in the basics of it. And uh, but then again, uh, I, I did felt discriminated by my first sergeant. For some reason or another, he, he just distracted him right. So I felt it. Can say the thing, you know, but I. <coughs> and, uh, How did you feel it? What did he do? Well, because he. <coughs> he always pick on me for some reason or another. He, even in the standing in line, you know, flooded, blah, 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 you know. I could see the other guys were worse than I, you know, but you, you felt it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> And um, as a matter of fact, I was recommended to be a corporal by the, my captain because uh, he, he was having a, he taking some of the training, uh, the classes he was giving us, and I excelled in that class, <coughs> according to him. But then uh, my sergeant cut, uh, what are against it or talk him out of it? So I, I didn't get the, the corporal's rating. How'd you feel about that? Yeah, yeah that's the thing that happens. You know, a lot of stuff I can remember that he heard there for a while, but he took it. Why did you feel you had to take it? Huh? Why did you feel you had to take it? <laughs> because when I say you can do, you, you know, he does say if you feel somebody doesn't like you, and you cannot prove that he doesn't like you, mm. but you feel it. It's like you feel somebody that uh, resents you for some reason or another, and she, they can help it. They just you show it. It's okay. like you show love. You show uh, you feel it when there, there's a cariño, when, when there is uh, resentment, mm -hmm. and sometimes it goes away. Sometimes you can improve it, but with him, I never could. Okay, we're going to stop there and hear. No, <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, things are like happening, mm -hmm. and hopefully, uh, something like this will go into the media. And uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, the. the now we're just getting to. Um, the World War II, your activities in World War II. So you were sent after basic training to, tell me about what happened after basic training. After basic training, <coughs> they sent us to Fort Ord, uh, and instead of being at, at tank corps, it was amphibious company. It's where you, it's like a tank, but it goes into the water. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and th there's the time that we were training up there when I, <clears throat> I developed an, e an injury above my rectum that uh, <clears throat> need to be eventually operated on. Because mm. it could, in other words, because of the bouncing. Because of the bouncing on uh, yeah, the boat? Uh, okay. uh, so I could not be sent overseas because we were ready to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And the final examination, the doctor said, no, you, you can't make it there. Yeah. So they brought me out of that outfit and put me into the uh, medical field, mm -hmm. assigned there in Fort Ord. <clears throat> they there for a while, and then they assigned me to a field hospital. <clears throat> From there, the outfit left, I don't know where it went up. So it became a, a medical, and they sent me to a dental school, to Denver, Colorado. Wow. <clears throat> so I stayed there about six months at the Fitzsimmons Hospital. 
and they went to the, the technical school. From there, they came back to Fort Ord. Fort Ord again, they assigned me to, to a dentist, the other department. And that's where I spent the rest of my Army days, mm -hmm. in the dental department, with, between the laboratory and the dental assistant. <clears throat> that's when we, as a group, we went to France. That was what? Went to France, mm -hmm. overseas. The whole unit? The whole unit. Okay. Whole, whole. What was the name of that unit? <clears throat> or did it have a number, the unit? I don't remember the... Okay. The hospital, field hospital was for... Okay, so that was the first time you were out of the United States, I would imagine, yeah, right? But, yeah, as mm -hmm. a unit. Mm -hmm. And as an individual too, right? You yeah. had not. So what was that like? What was a typical day for you like? Well, it was nice and it was pleasant because uh, <clears throat> most of the time after we got there, we just stood around waiting for it to be a, a sign up to the front lines. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we just uh, performed a little duties here and there. So we had a lot of time to socialize as we started learning the, the French. And what city in France were you? We, it was Marseille. Mm -hmm. We landed up there, stayed a few months there, mm -hmm. and tried the group. <clears throat> then from there we went to, uh, uh, what's the name of the city? Normandy? Uh, northern part of France. Um, Orly, Normandy? I don't want to slip my mind. Mm. It's a it's mostly German uh, town. The reason is because uh, half of the population were German descent. Because mm -hmm. close to German, okay, right. how the war the war ends and people change, the flag right. change, but the people stay there. Right. So half of them were French uh, nationals or appearance and everything. Spoke German and, and, uh, and French, and then the rest French people, you know, Germany. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is where uh, I, I used to socialize a lot there. Mm -hmm. And what was that socialization like? Where did you go to restaurants or dances? Or? Go there. Stands <clears throat> well, this is the, 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 the funny part. Most of the time, the, the area. The people there socialized at 10 o'clock on. This what we had yeah. curfew. <laughs> so uh, what are you going to do, right? So I came up with an idea. And uh, I used to stay there at, uh, until about 10 o'clock to go. Then all of a sudden, I took my tie off, threw up my pants, started dancing out with the rest of the French people, OK? Because there's a lot of French people that buy to the market, you know, Levi, and they have khakis and stuff, and it looks like a, a soldier, but a French. Hmm. So that's common. And of course, with my <coughs> color, you know, I could look anything, I suppose. So anyway, by after 2 or 3 in the morning, I start sneaking back to the camp. I get stopped with a Patrol, okay. Hey, what are you guys doing here? What is that? You J.I.? Pas compris. Pas compris. Pas compris. He said, oh, you bad word for frogs, you know. Get out of here. And they kicked me in the fanny and we must you, we must you. Humble up and here we go, okay. <laughs> and I passed by. As soon as I started back to camp, put my back tie on and roll my pants up, <laughs> go back to sleep. <clears throat> Your mother told you to be a good boy. Well, it's <laughs> 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 one of the social things. But most of the time, you know, during the day, we used to socialize and, of course, sit there with a big cigar or holder and just pretend you're, you're a tourist up there. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we start practicing with the ladies, uh, the French, and 
Did the French girls like you? Yes. So, so, so they, and, uh, up north, the uh, German girls also, they, uh, they like people, I guess. But I, I, I did socialize and I get good friends. Good. And uh, I created a lot of jealousy to my friends, you know, because I scored and they didn't. Scored? How do you define score? Well, the score because uh, the socialize and they sit with me and they're dancing and, okay. you know, they would buy me drinks, this type of thing. <coughs> and uh, so you, you, you get attracted to people, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the best way I can say it <coughs> without going into details because I don't think that's nice. <coughs> and of course, after you're not over there, uh, you start feeling, the, hey, wait a minute, I, I better behave myself. I want to, don't get no problem over here. Because mm -hmm. you never know, but the jealousy part of the natives up there. Mm -hmm. Because they resent the soldiers coming over and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, bring the, the ladies to your table, this type of thing. Luckily, they, they, we had to be out of there before 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. That's when the act, real action starts out. Yeah. And the name of this town, we're still trying to remember the name of this town, huh? Uh, Goats, Goats, come on. We'll have to look on a map. Because huh? we'll have to look on a map, because yes. I'm not sure. Did you dis feel any discrimination when you were overseas? Besides, there, no? No? No discrimination, but, but uh, as far, uh, being Mexican, that time, I feel no discrimination anymore. If I if it was there, I didn't, I didn't see it, I didn't felt mm -hmm. it. So it was very nice and pleasant. Mm -hmm. So, and there no racial tension between the enlisted men and, and your <coughs> outfit? Not, no. not overseas. By that time, no, not overseas. No. Were there any African Americans? Not on no. our units, no. Okay. Did so you? That time, we were still separated. Did you write letters to home? Yeah. Yeah. How often did you write? Oh, probably uh, weekly. Yes. Yeah. Did you keep a journal or a diary? No, I yeah. never did. And were there any major battles that you were in? No, no yeah. major battles. We were close to it. We, mm -hmm. <coughs> we were uh, hit the uh, rating signs there on uh, on Marseille, mm -hmm. and we had to go underneath to the shelters, right. but uh, outside of that, not, nothing happened. Okay. All right. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, so now, uh, anything else about your war French experience that you want to tell me? Uh, did, you did tell me what you did on a daily basis at work, right? You were working in the medical field? In the medical field, uh, it was mostly Assistant to the, the doctors okay. as a dental assistant. Okay. Did you receive men that were in battle that might have? Yes. Said that's what happened. Yeah. How did that make you feel when you saw them? I kind of feel sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, I noticed that some of them were you know, they seemed like they were disoriented. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> They didn't want to talk too much about anything, and uh, uh, mentally disturbed. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> and so as a matter of fact, I even noticed that when my number two son he went to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and he he got a little mixed up. Yeah. Not bad, but it does happen to, uh, a lot to the. Mm. to the soldiers, but they was coming back. I can imagine the cases we're going to be getting after the war is over. Yeah. Even now that we're getting, <coughs> yeah. even now. Okay, so now let's go after the war, post-war. How were you treated when you came home by your family and the community? And what did you feel about your service to your country as a Latino? <coughs> oh, I feel great. I'm very proud. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I, I joined there at the, in Wasco, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, specifically very active there. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, start fighting again for the discrimination. Uh, one of the cops over there uh, kind of resented, he was a veteran, but kind of resented the, uh, the Mexican Americans, I, mm -hmm. I felt. So consequently, I, I kind of challenged him, you know. And uh, he uh, said, hey, you're all right, you know. But then we had a big festival up there where my <coughs> brother-in-law, by the time I was married, it, it was a little bit much to drink, so put him in jail. So I wanted to ask him out to see if I can get him out. And I got thrown in jail also by this guy. What year was this? This was after yeah, the war? Just because I, yeah. I, I, I happened to be challenging, you mm -hmm. know. And this was after the war? After the after war. After you had served your country? Yeah, mm -hmm. still <clears throat> working there, mm -hmm. the community there, okay? And um, I knew the postmaster, the, uh, the um, mixing to the Anglo there. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that Wasco is also very discriminatory. It was so part of the, of the Okis or Anglis mm -hmm. uh, were living in than the Mexicans and the Negroes on the right. outside. Theater, first it was uh, gringo side, this type of thing, Negroes and, and uh, Mexicans on the other side. So you can buy uh, east of a, a, a west of the town because mm -hmm. there was all the Anglos, the business people and everything. Anyway, uh, I was put in jail, came out, next uh, it was Saturday, so Monday we went up to court. By that time I went and talked to the postmaster and who's the brother of the judge and we talked to the commander. He said, you know, this is not right, blah, blah, what happened, okay? So anyway, when we went over to the court, it was just a room like this one, so here. And I had these three important guys behind me. Wow, they came out to support you. Yeah, <clears throat> so I went to tell my story of what happened. And, okay, so what else is there? But one of the things is, uh, were you drunk? Well, I've been drinking. Yes, mm -hmm. but I was behaving. But if if you're drinking, you say, I'm guilty. Yes, okay. It's just <clears throat> we get let go, Dad. No resistance arrest, no nothing. Just pay your fine, twenty five dollars. Okay. <coughs> we did that. Okay. <clears throat> and the chief of police was there, right? And uh, okay, if I pay for the came back, Ralph, come here. He took me to his office. Mm -hmm. He says, "Look, you son of a bitch." He says, "Blah blah blah." The next time, you know, deal with your person. I said, "Well, I mean, don't say anything. It's telling you right now." Okay, open the door. Okay, Ralph, have a good time. Behave yourself. Close the door. I look back at him. It's so <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well. I told the story back again, you know, to the right persons. Believe it or not, two months later, I seen the Shiva police in Bakersfield giving parking tickets. I like to believe <laughs> of instrumental of him losing his job. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the kind of activity that I've been working on, you know. <laughs> for the improvement of uh, us Mexicans, mm -hmm. Americans. It took a lot for you to go and ask the postmaster to support you. Well, well yeah, you, uh, you, but you had to have the right connections. You had to feel you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. You had to be honest. <clears throat> and, uh, and you had to believe that you were entitled to that. Well, you have to believe you, uh, yeah. you've been in justice. Right. That's the main point. It was an yeah. injustice done. And did you see that, that you had served your country, and so you shouldn't be treated this way? That connection. Did you under feel that? 
and still feel as, as everything came over to uh, Los Angeles area mm -hmm. in 1963. Can I go there, Rob? Um, I'm going to see. So, do you feel it was difficult for you to get back into civilian life after the military? No, no. It was, to me, it was a challenge trying to. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I learned in the Army that I was not as dumb as I, I thought I was. Mm. Being associated with the rest of the Anglos, the rest of the world, where there were different ethnicity, Indians, Polish, are, uh, Jewish. Uh, some of my friends that were they, they got were Jewish, and um, particularly France. Mm. Also, another thing there. Experience I had in France there. Tell me. <clears throat> there was in Marseille. Uh, I had these two friends, Jewish friends, that we kind of picked together. So I invited them over to <coughs> one of the social workers. And the French in Marseille were just like L.A. Colonists of uh, Spaniards, colonists of Italian, mm -hmm. colonists of Jewish. And uh, then uh, inside the city, the mixture of everybody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I went to this uh, Jewish section up there. and. Uh, so I was like a party and dancing and stuff. <coughs> so here I was, okay. At that time, they didn't know too, that much uh, French, okay, just one word or two. <coughs> so I started, you know, dancing there with somebody. And then uh, I, uh, I was going to present a group, a, a ladies there, must have been a five or six. And they were uh, talking Spanish. Huh. So I kept dancing around. <coughs> <laughs> Left this girl, went over there. When I started, señoritas, you know what I mean? Ah, habla español, this and that, yeah. No castellanos, yeah. Anyway, I had these five girls on my tape dancing all the storm. Oh. Then my two brothers got jealous. How come I control <laughs> This part I think, you son of a bitch, what the hell are you? It's a gift so, to know so, another language. So, so <laughs> the, 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 this is the thing that they, you get a pleasure, you remember the pleasant yeah. things that happen. And this year I never went back again, but uh, you recognize uh, the environment and the difference of the uh, top of the world, what mm -hmm. it's all about, no difference in here. Because uh, the, the, to me, Europe was a mix of uh, mm -hmm. nationalities, wherever yeah. you went. <clears throat> the same thing in uh, Goetz, I think the city we land up Goetz, with. Goetz, yeah, that might be it. Goethe, Goethe. We'll yeah. look on a map. How did you learn French? You said you told me you, 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 you were able to converse in, in French. Because uh, in, in, the, in the social, of uh, talking to people, the French people, Okay, and then I started uh, uh, forcing myself to talk, and, and of course they had a, a book they gave you. Okay. Uh, okay, I started picking it up and uh, studying it, of course. <coughs> and uh, just picked it up. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time I understood what they were saying. I couldn't make lengthy, lengthy conversation, but enough to co communicate this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> were there any other members of your family in the military? No. No? Okay. And do you think that life changed for Latinos after the war? Were there more opportunities? Or? Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I believe so. At least open for me. Oh, yeah, the, or the, like the, uh, the, the service opened my eyes uh, the, mm -hmm. to be more aggressive, to survive, Good. and not be so satisfied with what I'm doing. I can do better. And uh, start improving yourself. Good. Uh, what did you do after the war? Did you marry? Did you have children? <coughs> I married. Right after the war? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and got married and we have the three children. Mm -hmm. And this is where I started looking for uh, see if helping my, my folks whenever I could, because they were still always in need. It was growing up. 
Now, I think you told me, though, that you married your first wife. Uh, maybe you were, it was during the war because you had to... Yes, uh, during the war. Okay, so you were still in the military, I mean. Cause yes, then you was, said uh, just, just before I went overseas. Okay, just before. Because you said when you came out, you had to go back home because <laughs> she was waiting for you there. Yeah. Okay, so just before you went overseas, you married Rosa. Mm -hmm. And that must have been 19... <coughs> 1945, 46, I okay. forget what it is. Okay, 1945, married Rosa. Okay. Yeah, because of it. Okay, and you met her in Wasco. In Wasco. Okay, all right, got that. And so you came out of the service, you moved back to Wasco, and uh, Rosa was there. You didn't have, was she pregnant before you went to the war, or you started to have children after? After. Okay. <coughs> and tell, and did you teach your children Spanish? Yes. They speak Spanish and English, your children? Uh, my daughter, that's she never picked it up. Okay. My two boys, they still do. As a matter of fact, I, my oldest son, uh, mm -hmm. he just resigned from a dean from Rio Hondo College. Mm. And uh, my number two son, he went to uh, electrical field. And uh, Recently, he had an accident, so he had to quit working. But he's doing okay because he, his insurance and um, the union mm -hmm. <coughs> grant him his uh, rights for retirement. Um, did you participate? Tell me why you said you joined the American, uh, the VFW, and you joined GI Forum. Well, <clears throat> before the Jeff Farm gets started, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Pico Rivera, we, we were very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I joined there because I was very active in the other ones. But uh, since the Jeff Farm was uh, mostly to, to enhance uh, Mexican American activities in the Army. I fell in love with it. I felt obligated to do it. Mm -hmm. Plus, um, <clears throat> at that time, I was uh, very active in Pico Rivera. With, uh, I was first war director for the Mexican-American Equal Opportunities Foundation. Okay. That's I, I was the first uh, board directors, which is now is a multi-dollar multi, uh, outfit here in L.A. American Equal Opportunity. I don't know if you heard of it or not. I have Equal Opportunity Organization, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Donicio Morales was uh, the founder. Mm -hmm. And you were on the, the board of directors. The first board of directors, mm -hmm. yeah. It started with $1,000 and his seller was $700. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he had the idea how to get funds in there. And this would. The first one that came with the grant, I dropped out, he took over, and they went. I'm so proud to know you. Yeah. That, yeah, 90 <laughs> years, and when you, you, you think you started cotton picking, and look at everything that you've done. <laughs> yeah. and, and I can't believe you're 90 years old. It's, I looked at you and hey, I said... Wh why do you have to mention numbers? <laughs> Because <laughs> I can't I, believe it. Look at no, you. No, 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 no. You're really. healthy and you're sharp and you just remember everything. It's no, the, the reason is because after I got my first divorce, I joined the Parents Without Partners. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're in Whittier. Okay, yeah. another organization. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Parents Without Partners. Were you raising your kids? No, no, after I got divorced. Okay. But I uh, thought Parents Without Partners were people who had kids. That were well, yeah, yeah, parents without okay, partners. But, but In other words, we're not married. Okay. You see? Mm -hmm. Well, you're a parent. You're not married. Right. You're single. Okay. And uh, what I'm raving at, that later down the years, my number two son got divorced and joined the parents without partners. Hmm. So what I did when I joined, I took my, uh, myself 10 years off. Okay? <clears throat> and then he's, he's coming in, you know, he said, you know what, son of a gun? Remember, take 10 yourself, okay? 
<laughs> because he, he starts tapping some of the young girls that I, I, I was getting acquainted with. <laughs> Okay. And, 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 and then, uh, about a, a year ago, I got an interview uh, <coughs> with the Whitty News mm -hmm. and the Senior Citizen. Right. So I was coming out having a, a function there, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and they approached me and said, okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah. They said, some of the Whitty News is, um, what do you think about the new uh, uh, goal about uh, Obama, you know, he knew his piece about uh, yeah. the, he started a year ago right. with, with yeah. the health care. Right, health care. Well, I don't think it's a bit of a good idea, you know, sp spread my opinion up there. Okay, for this reason, it's a reason, okay. He says, how old are you? When were you born? He says, oh, 10, 20, no, I'm 79 years old. I just came like that, okay, taking 10 years off. <laughs> Well, took my picture, and next day came out on, on the front page with my age there. <laughs> and my comment. <laughs> there was two other guys, you know, that uh -huh. they, they came at the same time. So everybody, you know, are you and really there? Oh, yes, that's why I am. <laughs> <coughs> Up till now, they don't know exactly my age. And mine neither. If anybody asks me, I ask, do you really need to know? Because uh, I'm not going to tell yeah. you. And I always take 10 years off, too, so I'm right there <coughs> with you. <laughs> um, let me see. Tell me why you choose to be Republican. <coughs> because uh, there was a group of us that uh, active in Whittier uh, that were kind of concerned because the, the Democrats were not doing anything specifically to improve the uh, the Mexican American community, We're talking about their the local politics okay, mm -hmm. in California. So let's form a, a committee there, it's Republicans, and uh, advocate, you know, that uh, as Republicans, you know, they could do something better. That's what we did. So form a, therefore, about a year was active in that mm -hmm. little section there. As a Republican. But whose idea was it? Was there, did somebody it's, from the Republican yeah, Party come yeah, and talk to you? Yeah, uh, Mexican Americans. It was a group yeah. of Mexican Americans. Okay. And we just thought maybe that uh, we can become, rep Mexicans can become Republicans, it's my quest, whatever it is, but mm -hmm. hey, let's look for the community. Like right now, we're working for people that put in Congress, whatever it is, to look for the people mm -hmm. of America, okay? And it went and started looking for themselves. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somewhere or another, I get letters from the uh, Republicans, and so I get from Democrats, because I changed back when I vote with the Democrat. Mm -hmm. When you vote, you vote Democrat? Yeah, when I vote. I changed back to uh, the Democrat when voting. Why? I so I wanted to, I guess. Okay. Uh, just, I feel that my mother would be a Democrat, that's it. So what are you right now? Democrat. Democrat. Did you vote for Obama? Do you support Obama? Obama? Yes. Yeah. Like I said, the last time when I went to Republican, we just a group of us that thought mm -hmm. we changed. Okay. See if they think the Republicans would change. Uh, but I felt they, they, they changed nothing either. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will stick to my, back to my Democratic ways. Okay, so now you're Democrat. Got it. Do you remember during World War II when uh, the Zoot Suit riots were going on? Do you remember hearing the about that? The Zoot riots? Suit riots when the Navy officers or Navy sailors were coming to Los Angeles and oh, beating up on the Pachucos? The Pachucos. Yeah. yeah. What did you think about that? That was lousy. Yeah. Here again is... Um, <sighs> Because of uh, ideas of some youth at that time, which was one of them, okay, uh, the, the army or, or somebody just discriminatedly, hey, let's kick the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. I think it was right, you know. You say, hey, let them do whatever they're going to do. Mm -hmm. They have the right to jail, kick, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
but not to take hints. I mean, Ekman, I mean, how they act and why must have been a, um, emotional in part of the service people. Right. Not because they knew they were right or wrong, this type of thing, or, or didn't care right or wrong. They just, they want to uh, have fun in a cruel way. Yeah. Uh, do but you think, in your life experience, do you think there's a story to, about World War II that has not been told? Or has the story of World War II been told accur accurately? No, I don't think everything's accurately because uh, the government doesn't want us to know exactly how we got the, in those wars, why we in the war. Mm. Okay? And. Uh, <clears throat> World War II, for example, well, we were attacked, I can see that. And we had to, somebody attacks me, I had to fight back. I was for it, World War II. And I felt it was, that we did the right thing as far as uh, defending mm -hmm. the whole world, for that and, matter. And when you see, stories about World War II and they don't have Latinos in them? Do you think? Well, why? Yeah. Because uh, I still feel the discrimination on all of us. Mm -hmm. And mostly uh, the Anglo world because they don't, under, they don't understand the minorities and because it's, it's, it's in, uh, embedded in us. They, we, we don't try to fight it back to kind of be fair and recognize we're all human beings equally, mm -hmm. particularly in this nation where we're free to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, some people, they, they just embedded that they, they, they hate, hate something, they hate something they don't, just because their parents did it or whatever. Now, you said um, that none of your children went to military? None of who? None of your children were in the military? No, my number two went. Your number two went, okay. Okay, I'm looking at some, I'm looking at your, your uh, stepbrothers. Mm -hmm. But your number two son did go, where, yeah. what war, where did he Viet serve? Vietnam. And what is his name? Daniel Flores. Daniel Flores. Mm -hmm. I th we'd like to interview him someday. Vietnam? Yeah, because we're also oh, doing. Oh, he would love to. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just him yesterday. <clears throat> we'll give him the, I'll give you a, a application to give to him. And tell me what you think about his service. Well, uh, I, he was willing to go, but then we kept in touch. Do, uh, he served honorably. Mm -hmm. He heard himself over there, so for, I forget, his leg or something happened. <clears throat> but he, when he came back, he back a little different, cocky, and he was single. Right after he came back, and he said he wants to get married. I tried to um, discourage him not to. He's not ready for, for a while. I said, well, just here's my, my marriage license. Hang on for a while. Okay. <coughs> And one weekend, I was up playing golf for the weekend, came back, there he was waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And I have a 57 T-bird. <clears throat> so I got down and said, what's happening? Well, when are we get married today? No, you can't. Said, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I went to the trunk, got to marry. I said, well, that afternoon, about four or six o'clock, something like that, they went to Downey and got married. Hmm. But uh, he's a very good kid. We we get we like one another. We're good kids. Mm -hmm. And your other son is the the same thing. Real he's just, hunter. just retired uh, the first of the the year. Wow. He was there yesterday, and uh, I wasn't home. But what he did, I don't know. But we kept in touch. And your daughter? Same thing. He came over and he was sick uh, during the holidays. Came home, brought him some soup. <coughs> Very nice. We, we very much. There's very much love 
in our family. Mm -hmm. And are, do you live with your second wife now? No, no, I oh. got divorced there oh, got... Uh, six years ago. Okay, we still have to finish our form here. Is there any advice you'd like to give to Latinos who might be looking at this video? Any advice you'd like to give to Latinos who would be looking at this tape out of your wonderful <coughs> life? Wonderful, exciting, marvelous life you've had. Oh my goodness, uh, look at the ups and the side of life. Look for something to make you happy, and that's right. And uh, I know there's a, a lot of uh, discrimination still there exists there. It's a uh, try to overlook it, but at the same time, you have a chance to fight for the rights. Okay? Yeah, what is right is right, let's fight for it. And there's going to be no end to it. So I see it, because I've seen that discrimination in Mexico, I've seen it in Europe, and it's, it's part of life. Mm -hmm. But let's help ourselves here, because we need it. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? I think you've told me a lot of story. I just want to make sure I've got it all. Well, the, the only thing is just believe in the good Lord. It's always there to help us out. That's true. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mr. Flores. Yes, it has just you. been an honor and a pleasure oh, to, to be your, your interviewer. And you you're sweet, Harvey. Your, your, your personality may, made it worthwhile. Oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Well, you know why? Because I love what I do. Mm -hmm, I yeah. love what I do. And I think, as you say, when you love what you do, you're going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to turn this off right now.